Yellow Jacket by Alex Dawes. We start early, morning on the edge of night, head torches shining into the Arctic black. Guide ropes take us into the sky. Up, up, up we climb until my blood runs cold and my hands tremble. By 11, we're at 19,000 feet and the mountain has us in its palm. Okay, Babu asks a few steps in front. Yes. I mutter. No time for anything else. Even words have weight here. Leave them at base camp where they belong. They will only slow you down. We walk into the day through drifts of brittle snow. Every step's a battle. Three gasps needed for just one at sea level. Exhaustion wells up in my ankles. Invisible hands restrain me. I think about lying down, how cool the snow would be against my skin, how white the sky above me. But then I see my first body and think better of it. This one died in the mountain nine years ago, Dominic tells me. We both stare. We see a face down, huddled thing, with fingers jutting out of the snow. You knew him? Dominic shakes his head. We call him Yellow Jacket. Every year climbers come and a few are left behind. Some are tipped into ravines, but many lie where they fall. The mountain gathers corpses like a body accumulates fat. Many become landmarks, their real names long forgotten. Dead Woman Pass, Green Boots, and now Yellow Jacket. Eight years ago he died, Babu corrects. It was the year we watched Liverpool win the cup final in Kathmandu, remember? On we go. Dominic walks attentively behind me. They're always careful to keep me between them, Dominic and Babu. And each so different. Dominic so tall, pale, grave and Etonian, and Babu short with a fleshy red face that falls naturally into a smile. They seem to know each other's thoughts without speaking. They do it with a look, a gesture. The other body is just over this ridge, Dominic explains. Thin clouds of vapour dissipate at his mouth. Before the icefall. Good, I think. Not today, Kumbu icefall. Every night I see it in my dreams. A stately river of deathly ice with range large enough to lose an office building in. And every day it changes, melting and refreezing, with new ways to kill. There, just after lunch, Babu points into the white haze. He's there. It takes an hour to reach. The body lies face down with an arm stretching into the east. Gloved hands grip empty air. We descend within touching distance. The ground slopes to 70 degrees. Gravity reaches up from the depths with giddy hands, and I resist a ghoulish urge to step over the edge. He's been here a year. Wet hair flutters in the wind from under the brim of an ice-crusted hat. Dominic shields his eyes. The hair melts and refreezes. He takes a swig from a silver water bottle. It's normal. The body is just out of reach. Its hat gathers in my fingertips, brittle with ice. I edge forward, and tiny stones scatter into the black. Do not unclip your ascender, Babu warns. I yank the hat free, but the hair beneath is grey with frost. Is it him? Drums beat inside my skull. It's the altitude. My sinuses need draining. His hair was red. Babu shrugs. They all look like that up here. Of course. The sun and snow strip colour and life. 
Let's see his face. We turn the body and see features caked in ice and eyes white with snow. A child of the winter mountain. Dominic glances upwards and seems troubled. Well? An evil sky darkens. Needles against my eardrums. I want to vomit. I stand to get a better look. This is my brother, I decide. We lash him to our shoulders and drag him over the snow, with Babu doing most of the hard work. He's the strongest on the mountain. Thick skin and even thicker blood. I stagger behind, a useless passenger. Leave the bag, Dominic orders. We heave it into a ravine. Pictures. My brother's final meal. I don't want to think about what's in there. Six hours later, we're back at base camp. The body seems stark and offensive on the fringes of civilization. Dozens of tents strung with prayer flags dot the scrubby moonscape. Babu throws a tarp over my brother, but not for my sake. It's climbing season and busy. A corpse among the tourists would be bad for business. Rest, Dominic orders. We lie in the dark of his tent, breathing. The pressure on my head relents. Three cups of tea, innumerable chocolate marshmallows and a bowl of spicy rice later, I begin to feel human again. Father's grey head pokes into the tent from outside, floating there like a hunting trophy. You found him? Babby slurps his tea. Yes. Good. Father throws a look behind him. She's waiting. We take my brother to father's tent and lay him outside. Father slips inside and a blue light wakes, throwing mother's silhouette into the night. I see her nodding, stuffing down her emotions. Even in front of me she won't cry. She keeps everything inside until it turns black and bitter. Meanwhile, I try to arrange my brother into a solemn pose, but Dominic stops me with a grim warning. He will fall to pieces if he thaws. I throw the tarp back over the body. Now we can make a grim unveiling. We wait in the wind until the tent unzips, and out they come. First father, long leg like an insect emerging from a cocoon. Then mother, wrapped in a blue coat, standing barely at his shoulder, small face in an angry frown. Here. Father rolls back the tarp with his long surgeon's fingers, and a shockwave seems to ripple outwards. Mother steps forward, and we all take a half step back and close our eyes, as if a mother's grief for physical and needed space to breathe. A wind sweeps down from the mountain, and a stillness captures us. In front, I hear movement in the darkness, then a familiar, disappointed sigh. Idiots! I open my eyes. Mother is staring right at me, her face all daggers and blinds. It's not him, she hisses. It's someone else. A horrified silence fills the dark. Father recoils with an ashen face. She's right, I realise. The forehead is too narrow and the jaw too square. Well? Mother points to the corpse at her feet. Don't you know your own brother from a stranger? Even to my ears, her Glaswegian vowels sound harder than granite. Father is silent. He knows this will be his mistake too. He should have noticed earlier. Babu and Dominic stare at me. It must have been the altitude sickness, I say weakly. Altitude sickness, Mother repeats. She whirls dismissively back to her tent. You'll have to try again. We take two days' rest. I wake each morning with a bruised heart and burning lungs. Intelligence is gathered in the meantime, and we set off on Thursday. The Mexicans tell us about a man between camps one and two, and the Swiss have a picture. It looks like my brother, as far as can be discerned, and it is consistent with the story we have. 
Arthur died on the way down after summiting. Not enough fuel left in the tank. Very common, Babu tells me. We find the body in the western coombe, a rolling valley with undulations like the rib of a hollowed-out whale. You're certain? We crouch over the body. The face is tight and yellow, mouth wrinkled and shrunken, eyebrows stripped by the elements. It could be Arthur. It's his jacket, I say. I'm surprised by how hot it is. The sun shines down from a cloudless sky and the valley blasts heat upwards like a pale furnace. That brand is common, I'm told. We decide, and eleven hours go by under a velvet sky to get into base camp. Let's go straight to her, Dominic decides. Get it done. We find my parents' tent, a bulging outcrop of red canvas among the rock and snow. What does your mother do when she's not on the mountain? Dominic asks as we wait. I think about lying, but settle on the truth. She's a judge. <laughs> of course she is, Dominic laughs. Mother emerges, stony, immovable, grey hair like a snow-capped peak. She seems more mountain than the rock behind her. Father produces a halogen torch and shines it downwards. A blanket of cloud obscures the starlight. Mother bends down. She is functional in her mood this time. Professional. Detached. This body has tits. She lets the silence hang. Deafening and brutal. You've brought back a woman. Babu takes a knee before rising a few seconds later. Confirming Mother's observation with a grave nod. She throws me a stony look. Why can't you just let him go, I want to say. But the words stick in my throat. Dominic mounts our defence. The body must have changed shape on the way down with the air pressure. It was an honest mistake. Mother fixes him with a deadly stare. I'm not interested in your mistakes, honest or otherwise. I want my boy, and no one's getting paid until I do. Dominic stiffens. That's not what we agreed. Weeks on the mountain, and I know the subtleties of his face well. He's on the edge of murder. Mother holds a ground. An unstoppable force meets an immovable object. The deal was for my son, she says. You said you had a location. No son, no payment. Dominic takes a breath. He could be anywhere. Down a ravine, under an avalanche, there are only two weeks of climbing weather left. Mother's face hardens. Then you better get a move on. The mistake was all of ours, but I feel the mood turn against me. Dark looks thrown in my direction as we walk back to Dominic's tent to convene a war council. You must put an end to this nonsense of us not getting paid, he urges inside. An upturned torch paints our faces in ghoulish shadow. It costs $11,000 just to buy climbing permits. Babu's wife is pregnant again. It's unthinkable our not getting paid. I nod helplessly but I'm more likely to move the mountain than mother, and they see it in my face. I will pay you, I say. Dominic's face curls with incredulity. With what? Your student loans? He lets go a heavy sigh. I wonder if I smell whiskey on his breath. I could have made a fortune taking German tourists to the summit, he groans. But instead, I had to fall for your sob story. We go the next morning with a plan. First, Hellfire Alley, over the icefall and back across the western coombe. Our final roll of the dice, a five-day trek. Corpses litter the place, apparently, and we go in search of morbid treasure. Juniper bushes are burnt for good luck, prayer tokens tucked into our backpacks, 
and the first two days go by in a terrible blur, the mountain unfolding like a slick white dream. We pass Yellow Jacket, heaped in snow. Some mother's son, but not the right one. And a day later we find a tent graveyard, its torn remains shredded by weather and time. What happened here? I ask, as we pick our way through the wind-whipped canvas. A storm came years ago, Babu whispers gravely. The campers were never found. The day runs through our fingers. A frail sun shines through thickening clouds, its light cold and fragile, and still no sign. But we search on, stricken at the limits of our hope. Our last chance, our final day. Night draws in, like a hand around our throats, and in the gathering starlight I see a human form against the rock, and even from a distance, I know the sullen hunch of Arthur's shoulders. He always sulked like that, I think. And I see him then as a boy, small and fierce and against the world. And a wave of grief takes me, more even than when the poems were read out at his memorial, or when father phoned me with the news of his death. We close the space with our hearts in our mouths. It's Arthur, I say. He has grandfather's watch. A brown leather strap with Roman numerals given to him when he turned 21. Babu rests a hand on my shoulder. A storm comes. I look up and see he's right. A knot of black cloud tightens above us as if the sky itself were frowning. Let's go, Dominic urges. We strap Arthur to our backs, but we don't make it far. The storm behind us hardens and sleet lashes the side of the mountain. Snow boils in a vortex towards us. The storm swallows us and we fall into its howling centre. So much cold and wind. Nature presses down on us with an indifferent hand. I flick a glance at Babu and see the fear of death in his face. We've pushed too far, I realize. Mother has made us desperate and stretched our judgment, and we have made a fatal error. I'm sure of it. There will be three more corpses in the snow this time tomorrow, and Mother will send another expedition, and the whole ghastly business will continue for eternity until the mountain is stacked with sons, all killed by her grief. There isn't much time, Dominic roars through the wind. Base camp is a million miles away, and we are in another solar system at the bottom of an ocean. There are the old tents, Babu screams back, which we passed before. A desperate hour later, and we are staggering from tent to tent, through tattered remains and wind-snapped poles. Exhaustion overtakes me, and I collapse, defeated onto the hard snow. Grey spaces form between my thoughts. I forget where I am, who I am. And then strong hands descend on me, and Babu gathers me by the shoulders, and together we fall into what passes for a tent, with Babu taping shut the shredded entrance behind us. Time passes. I lie in the dark, snatching at thoughts. Whether I'm alive or dead seems a distant matter. Abstract and of limited interest. Where's Dominic? I wonder aloud. Even my blood feels cold. Babu lies next to me, zipped deep into his sleeping bag. With your brother. Wind claws at the canvas from outside. It is too wild and dangerous to sleep. We sit up and eat a fruit cake, but it tastes of nothing. I don't like this place, I say. It's haunted, Babu whispers. The campers are still here. He swallows the last of his cake. I shiver. I hope they don't mind us using their tents. I try to laugh, but croak instead. 
Night deepens. There is no atmosphere outside, only darkness. I wonder if we're on a comet plunging through space, a sliver of canvas from oblivion. You were close to your brother, Babu asks. I never saw him. Arthur was always up a mountain or in a jungle or, or far out to sea, always fleeing or in search of something, but never finding or escaping it. Babu looks thoughtful, dark eyes shining in the torchlight. Some men only find peace in death's shadow. No, I think. Arthur only wanted to be free. Morning comes, white and still. I uncoil out of my bag and cut away the tent entrance, sure to find Dominic dead. But there he is, standing cheerfully in the snow, poring over the state of his gear. <laughs> Rough night, he grins. We climb through the morning, taking turns with Arthur behind us. A cold sun rises indifferently through the clouds, and I'm struck by the peace and silence the white snow and whiter sky, as if the mountain had screamed itself quiet. Why do this? I ask Dominic after lunch. To keep idiots like you alive, he barks. And Babu? For money. Babu grins. I have four daughters. They all want to be doctors. Morning passes into afternoon. This will all be over soon. I think, and a kind of sadness reaches up from inside, taking me by surprise. Your mother has already lost one son to the mountain, Babu asks later. Why send you? A cold silence passes. Dominic watches me carefully. I think for a while, reaching for an answer, and under the empty sky it comes more easily than it ever could at home. Arthur was always the favourite, I say, walking lighter. I was always caught in his wake. A few hours later, and we arrive at the Kumbu Icefall. God, mutters Dominic. The sun has made chasms in the ice. Silver ladders lashed together with rope glitter in the sun. I should take Arthur. They both stare at me. It's only right. Three ladders are taken in turn, with me crawling across on all fours. Arthur's body hitched across in front of me, cold metal against my knees. You're a natural. Dominic brings me to my feet on the other side. You'd make a top if you tried. Just like Arthur. I try to think of him there at the summit, with his fingers against the sky, already doomed. Perhaps he stayed too long, elated and unable to leave, invincible at the top of the world. And even if I'd been there to warn him, time is running out, he would never have believed me. A final ladder waits in the dying sunlight, two lashed together with rope, sagging where they meet in the centre, below a thousand feet of darkness. I can take your brother... Babu offers. You must be tired. No, I say. I've gotten him this far. I am halfway across where my crampon snags. Cold white metal stretches over a bottomless drop. Careful, Babu shouts. I wrench my foot free. Metal shrieks against metal. The ladder shifts and my head spins. Arthur slides away from me. I snatch at his wrist. But a voice rises up from somewhere between us. Just let me go. Just let me go. It's easier than I expect. My stiff fingers relent. Babu gasps. And Arthur disappears into the darkness, making no sound. An eternity passes. The ladder flexes with the loss of Arthur's weight. Dominic's voice comes across the void, quiet, 
and urgent. Don't do anything stupid. The ladder sways into stillness. I cling to metal over darkness, waiting. I still have Arthur's watch, and I, I'm amazed to see it still works. Tick, tick, tick. It is quarter past three, and in another galaxy, hearts will have just kicked off. I wonder absently about the score. Move. Babu bleeds from the edge. Please, move. His hands clasped into a prayer. My fingers and knees do their work, inching me across the ravine. Dominic pulls me to safety with a pale face. I wonder if he's about to throw me in after Arthur. But he simply laughs. <laughs> I suppose that's it. He shrugs. Later, with Dominic out of earshot, Babu whispers, Your brother is at peace now. We walk back to base camp in dreary silence, with nothing left. Just before Hellfire Alley, we pass Yellow Jacket. Dead so long, he's now a landmark. Sometimes he's covered, sometimes not, Dominic tells me. Some say he gets up and goes for a walk now and then. I uncover Yellow Jacket's face with the flat of my hand. Just another stranger in the snow. We all stand there, staring. An idea seems to bloom in the darkness between us, and Babu gives it shape. He's about the right height, he says. We drag Yellow Jacket down the mountain, with night snapping at our heels. Arrive at base camp, walk across the rumble of generators, and smuggle the body into Dominic's tent. I strap Arthur's watch to Yellow Jacket's wrist, swap his goggles, and stare at the body against the picture of Arthur in his gear. Not quite right, Dominic scratches his head. That woman we brought back, what colour were her shoes? It's grim work getting them off, but they fit. Lucky she had big feet, I find myself saying. We are deep into the swamp of our reception when Babu, of all of us, wonders aloud if we are doing the right thing. It is bad luck to lie at a funeral, he says, especially about a son. Dominic gestures at me with frantic hands. She has a perfectly fine son here to worry about. We make a few last-minute adjustments, smoothed hair, some tactically smeared snow, and take one last look at the body. Chances? Babu asks. Fifty-fifty, I say. We take the body to my parents' tent, with Dominic stepping inside first to lay down a preamble. I see his grim silhouette nodding mournfully in the night, like a ghost, shimmering in the darkness. Will it be okay? Babu asks earnestly. His skin seems almost translucent under the distant glare of the stars. He will have to live with it. I look at Yellow Jacket, a stranger who will never grow old, a body without any memories. He's some mother's son, I say. Dominic leads mother out, and the body is unveiled. The mountain seems to hold its breath. Mother peers down, her face inscrutable. Tight air crackles between us, and doubt hangs in her shoulders. But then she sees her father's watch, and Babu removes his hat and clutches it to his chest in a wordless prayer. <sighs> My boy, Mother whispers. My precious boy. Goodbye is a blur. All is settled, and we pack up our gear the following day, careful to keep Yellow Jacket safe distance from Mother's suspicious gaze. What next? I ask Dominic before I leave. A few weeks in the Caribbean, he says, and then Babu and I go back to summiting German tourists. 
No more adventures for missing brothers for us, he laughs. We share hugs and promise to stay in touch. Babu sends me a letter the following summer, complete with a picture of his fifth child. Of course, another daughter. Even mother thaws. Somewhere on the way home, in a jet-lagged stupor, she pours us both a whiskey in a sterile departure lounge. Only you could bring Arthur home, she whispers. And for the first time in a year, a weightless smile touches her lips. Yellow Jacket, whoever he is, follows us back to Scotland and is buried at great expense in the family plot, where he remains to this day. As for Arthur, he's still at the bottom of that distant ravine, ageless and frozen, and likely to be there long after I've turned to dust. Sometimes, in the passing shadows or in the space between a dream, I think about finishing the job, if Babu and Dominic will have me again. But, in the end, uh, I always dismiss the idea. I picture Arthur as I knew him, the Mud Street boy, flying towards me, the grin and swagger of the man he became, and decide I prefer him alive in my memory. Yellow Jacket was written by Alex Dawes and read by Mark Sangster. Studio production was by Mark Lingwood. It was brought to you by Tempest Productions. And now a word from our sponsor, which is us, Tempest Productions. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to help us make more, then why not buy us a coffee via Kofi? That's ko-fi.com forward slash Tempest Productions. That's ko-fi.com forward slash Tempest Productions. Thank you so much for your support.